All right, guys, there are no free lunches when it comes to knives. Now, what do I mean? I mean that there is a really good economic principle that applies to knives quite nicely. And what I mean by this is, and this principle is that there are no free lunches. And in economics, that essentially just means that there are always trade-offs and always costs to doing anything and everything, regardless to who pays, when they pay, or how they pay. And that is very applicable to knives. Now, I think in the outdoor, especially like survival and bushcraft knife community, this has gotten, we've gotten very lost in the sauce, so to speak, um, to really preference or have it put a high value on sheer durability of a knife. And just remember that when this happens, that there is always a trade-off to any blade that you choose, whether it's the steel, the design, the weight. If you want a knife that is more durable, you usually have to sacrifice. If you want a blade that has more or higher durability, you usually have to sacrifice corrosion resistance, edge retention. If you want a blade that is better suited for chopping, you usually have to sacrifice carryability and weight, and vice versa. If you want a blade that is more corrosion resistant, you usually have to sacrifice durability. If you want a blade that is more carryable, you usually have to sacrifice um, its usability in larger tasks. So ultimately, you know, there really is no such thing as a free lunch. There's no perfect knife, but but when it comes down to it, I think survival is an extremely basic principle or, you know, thing to do. It's a very basic kind of thing that you go about doing. And in that regard, when you are able to summarize what you're truly there to do, what you're truly there for, like the reason you are in that survival situation, or, or when you summarize what you are there to do, i.e. survive, is a lot easier to summarize or find a knife that fits those tasks. So essentially, today I want to talk about, you know, helping find or really narrowing down, like, what is a good survival knife? Because a lot of people surely prioritize things like durability, and when you do that, you get a knife that looks a lot like this Glock 81 field knife. And while this is probably one of the most durable knives here on this list, and probably in the world in general, this knife really doesn't hold a lot of good knife characteristics. It has a very poor grind and very poor bevel that is not very sharp at all and starts very far away from the actual handle. The handle is not very ergonomic, has a front guard that is honestly painful, and this large dopey kind of root saw here really does not offer you a lot of help in actual survival situations. So when you sheerly focus on just the durability of a blade, you're really going to end up with something that is not particularly usable. And that's kind of the moral of the story. And honestly, there are a lot more things to focus on than just sheer durability. That is why one of my favorite knives for survival is the Buck Thug. And this isn't some promotion for this knife. In fact, good luck trying to get one of these knives because they've been discontinued for many years. But anyways, the reason why I really do like this blade is it embodies a lot of principles with a survival knife that you should aim for. And that is, first off, it is a quite durable knife. It is made out of 5160 spring steel. And 5160, for me, is one of those steels that really, I think, checks off a lot of survival boxes. Now, about the only time 5160 is not going to be a good steel is if you deal with a lot of salt water. And in those cases, which we'll talk about a little bit later, you're gonna wanna lean into a more stainless option. But as far as just general purpose, non-salt water areas, 5160 is going to be not super rust resistant, so you'll have to watch your edge for corrosion, but it is going to be extremely durable. This is a spring steel, and it is super, super high in durability. Now, the other kind of disadvantage to 5160 is it doesn't have the best edge retention, but it is reasonably easy to sharpen. 
In addition to those points though, that's the steel that is really good, but the ergonomics are another thing that so many people leave out. Once again, if you're going for a sharpened pry bar, this isn't as important, but if you're really choosing a knife for survival, you want a knife that has a number of ways to hold it. And most importantly, you want a blade, especially if it's a longer blade, that you can choke up on. One of the most important things for survival is going to be things like doing feather sticks, creating feather sticks. It's going to be crafting traps. And what that requires is you to notch wood. So the easiest way to do those tasks is to be able to choke up on your blade and be right on that cutting edge. And as you can see with a blade that has a forward finger choil, you can get right up on that cutting edge and be very close to what you're trying to carve and cut. And not only will that help you expend fewer calories, it gives you a better mechanical advantage. Now, the buck thug, like I said, also allows you to kind of choke back and chop with it. That is not necessarily a prerequisite. And for me, I don't really love to chop with knives, especially knives like this that are reasonably lightweight because they're not going to be able to carry as much energy. But it really does, but the buck thug does honestly have in it a lot of very useful features and capabilities. So as I was saying, if you are operating in a more humid or just overall an environment with more water, especially salt water, you will want to move over to something that has a higher stainlessness value to it or just better corrosion resistance as a whole. Now, what this means oftentimes is that you will be now, what this means oftentimes is that you will be sacrificing some degree of durability because usually stainless steels are not going to be as tough or as resistant to shock. Um, so you do have to keep that in mind or take that into account. But at the same time too, I think there's a lot of uh, value or merit to be said in reasonable durability. And what that essentially means is that if you can do the hardest use tasks that you need to do out in the wilderness, say your objective is survival, right? So being able to baton wood, baton down, you know, medium to wrist thick trees, you know, anything that you can physically bend over and baton through, a knife should be able to do that. It should be able to process, you know, seasoned, wood um, into small kindling for fires and those types of tasks. If that blade can do it, then I would say that that blade is reasonably durable and is good enough for survival. Now, like I said, there's been a large trend, especially by some YouTubers that try to take their blades to the max and, you know, baton through things like rebar, you know, try to cut open cars with their knives. And while it is fun and entertaining to watch knives do that, it creates an unrealistic expectation that, um, field knives or wilderness blades, survival blades, should be able to do that task and that that should be the standard for them. And in all reality, it's just not very useful, very helpful, or very realistic in an actual survival situation to need to be able to do those things. So in the end, um, when it comes down to it, you know, finding a good blade is going to be a balance of meeting your needs truthfully and meeting your environment. So what do you need to accomplish and what is the environment that you're going to be doing those tasks in? Once again, this A1 is a really good example of a cold weather blade because of its fully rubberized handle. So there's no exposed tang here for you to touch, for you to lose heat or to become cold in extreme cold situations, unlike something like this Buck Thug. And so while this Buck Thug for me personally is a good sur summertime survival knife, in the wintertime, I would transition over to this A1. And once again, that's because it is a better blade for cold um, or just more cold resistant as a whole. And of course, more corrosion or water rust resistant and especially that's important in the winter when there is you know, standing snow that will turn to water if it heats up. So those are important factors, environmental factors to weigh in your choice of a survival knife. Once again, lastly, in closing, I think it's worth noting too that your blade, as I kind of mentioned before, is more than just a sharpened pry bar. There are other characteristics to take into factor, such as the ergonomics and comfort of the blade the materials that it's made out of, the edge retention, and 
the overall design of it. Once again, a sharpened pry bar is going to be good at durability and durability alone. But when you factor a true to form survival knife, it's about finding a jack of all trades and not a blade that simply specs into being a sharpened pry bar. Hopefully you found this video interesting guys, and hopefully this helps you with your knife choices. And once again, I try to re er, retain this level of reasonability when it comes to survival knives, because survival blades are so much more than just a sharpened pry bar. They are really useful tools for a wide variety of tasks. Some of those tasks more difficult or harder on the knife than others. But at the core, that is a survival blade. As always guys, God bless. And I'm